I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2017 ICS faculty panel on improving your graduate school application. I'm Professor Richard Lathrop, uh, director of the ICS Honors Program, and this started out as a presentation to the ICS Honors students that was then open to all students because of its general interest. Um, my colleagues will tell you that this is not the right reason to go to graduate school, and we'll spend the rest of the uh, session talking about that. But what this is a chart from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it's plotting educational attainment versus earnings and unemployment. So down here is less than a high school diploma, high school diploma, associates, bachelor's, master's. Professional degrees are veterinarians, dentists, lawyers, um, doctors, things like this, and finally uh, the doctoral degree. And what you see is that as you go up in educational attainment, not only do your earnings increase dramatically, but your unemployment decreases dramatically. Now this is not the right reason to go to graduate school, but what it does show you is that the, um, if you do, it will be worth your while. We're going to begin with um, Selena Mojica, who is uh, from the UCI Graduate Division, and we'll talk about their programs. Then I'll ask, introduce the faculty panel, ask them to give a brief soundbite for their question. I've collected questions that students typically ask, and they've been distributed to the faculty. Following their 60-second soundbite, we'll have discussion among the faculty panel, and then I'll open it up to questions from the students. At 11.50 promptly, I'll shoo the faculty out and we'll have a graduate student panel where current ICS graduate students will tell you what they really did to get in and what it's like being a graduate student. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Selena Mojica from the UCI Graduate Division. So we have some really great resources to the graduate division to help you prepare a competitive application for graduate school. So we have our graduate resource center. So you see the flyers over there on the table if you pick one up. One of our resources there is we have writing consultants so they can help you um, with editing your research or your graduate um, applications, your statements. So they're a great resource for you. You can make an appointment. The number for the graduate resource center is here on the bottom of this card. Also through the Graduate Resource Center, we have fellowship, or excuse me, grad prep advising sessions. So those of you that are interested in applying for grad prep, please make an appointment with um, one of our graduate division staff and they'll help go over your essays, help you, you know, talk about what graduate school is like, what graduate school is like here at UCI, what they're looking for. Um, another way to learn more about graduate school is our know-how sessions, which are beginning, I believe, next week. So it says fall 2016, which is a typo. This is the correct schedule for this um, quarter. So attend that. That's run by graduate students. So they'll tell you all the ins and outs of graduate school and how to apply as well. And also another opportunity is the diversity forum. So this is an opportunity to learn again how to make, uh, how to create a competitive written statement, how to apply to grad school, what are the things to expect in graduate school. So another great opportunity. It's free. It's on a Saturday. The bus leaves here at UCI and we'll take you over to Channel Islands and then take you back. So it's a long day, but it's good and informative. So I encourage you to use the resources at um, our graduate division to help you prepare a competitive application for graduate school. Let's thank Selena. <laughs> and there are materials here on the table if you haven't already got them. I'd like now to introduce the faculty panel. Uh, first, Dan Gillen, Professor and Chair of Statistics. And then we'll, we'll save our applause for the end. They're all distinguished and all worth the applause, so we'll do it again. Um, Ian Harris, Professor and Vice Chair of Undergraduate Studies, Computer Science. Melissa Masmanian, Professor and Vice Chair for Graduate Affairs, Informatics. Gopi Minatsi Shundaram, Professor and Associate Dean for Student Affairs, Computer Science. Marios Papathimio, Professor and Ted and Janice Smith, 
Family Foundation Dean, Computer Science, Andre Vanderhoek, Professor and Chair of Informatics, and Zhao Yu, Professor and Vice Chair of Undergraduate Affairs. So you see we have a nice sampling of the different uh, departments and a lot of the campus leadership that's involved in um, uh, admitting students. So I'd like now to go down and the faculty panel will give, they've each been assigned a question uh, collected from questions students commonly ask. And they're going to begin by giving a 60 second sound bite, then there'll be discussion here, and then I'll open it to the floor. Please go. <coughs> Sorry. I thought it was going to Wait, do oh, you okay. want me to start here? With okay, well let's start down there. That's actually one. Okay. Okay, so my question, hi everyone. My question is about the difference between a master's and a PhD program, and which one you might want to apply for, and what are the differences between them? Is this thing worth it? Hello? Yeah, it's better. It's better? Okay. Um, I actually am someone who has a master's degree at one institution. I went to uh, Michigan, and then I have a PhD at a different institution. I went to MIT. And um, not all degree programs do you do a separate master's. You can actually be enroll in a PhD program without a master's, but it depends a lot on the discipline and what, your, what kind of program it is. So I think that in a rule of thumb is that the more inter interdisciplinary the space, the more it might benefit you to get a master's before doing a PhD program. Um, though for some more traditional disciplines, you can, you know, it makes more sense to maybe do them together. That said, what is the difference between these kinds of degrees? A master's, the goal of a master's is to become an expert in the domain of study, to really go deeper than you're gonna get an undergrad in one kind of concrete domain and become an expert, and that can be a terminal degree. You don't have to necessarily get a PhD after that. The goal of a PhD, of course, it's much longer. You know, it's usually about, a master's is usually about two years, and a PhD is anywhere between four and six. The goal of a PhD is to take that expertise and then transform it to be a producer of new knowledge. So it's a big shift in orientation. You've spent your entire education up to that point consuming, learning, taking in what people tell you, doing research projects potentially, but all about the idea of becoming an expert. Where a PhD is now, it's your turn to put original thought and research back into the scholarly community that you've become part of. So that's the big difference between those two degrees. Okay. Thank you. All right, so my question is, uh, how can I decide which schools and programs to apply for? Um, I think there's, there's multiple parts to the answer. One is as many as you want. Right? So don't limit and put your hopes on one university. Um, spread the applications around. Um, but m more importantly is probably where, um, where do they do the kind of research that you would like to be engaged in. Different universities, um, even with the same departments, will have different strengths and weaknesses in terms of the research that they do. Um, and so it's, it's up to you to sort out which universities have individual faculty or groups of faculty that do the kind of work that I might want to do. Um, one way to do that is to actually go talk to your professors here. Um, we know our colleagues. We know where the better research groups are, where the maybe not so strong research groups are. Um, but we also know um, maybe even personalities and, and other kinds of traits that, that might be there. So we can also introduce you to some people at these other universities and say, hey, we have this student, student was in my class, I'm really interested in you know, statistics, um, I, you should go talk to this person, that person, and, and that person. And then we will make even the introduction for you, assuming you did well in our classes and other kinds of things. Um, but we, we gladly help you orient you towards where you might want to apply. So. Um, think broadly. Don't necessarily think about university reputation. Of course, it's great if you get into the best ranked university somewhere. Um, but that doesn't mean that great research isn't happening at other institutions as well. Um, and again, we, we can help you help you find that. So keep it at that. Fantastic. So the question that was posed to me is, what do admissions committees look for in making admissions decisions? Um, so the answer is, they look at a broad spectrum of evidence uh, of, of you being successful in graduate programs. This is gonna come in the form of past experience through GPAs. What was your 
performance in your undergrad? What types of courses were you taking and what were the GPAs there? GRE scores to try and standardize those scores. And, and letters are certainly important, and, and, and two types of letters, right? There's the self-statement letter. A lot of people, I think, um, think of that as a formality sometimes. That's not true. Admissions committees, we, we look at those self-statement letters. We want to kind of see what the background is on the individual. What are they bringing to the table? What is unique about them? What is your experience? Do you know what you're in for? Um, as well as letters from faculty advisors, people that truly know you. You know, you don't want the letters that basically say, yes, this was a person that got an A in my class. There were 112 people in there. No, it's, it's somebody that you know, that you went and talked to, that they know about what your goals are and what you're trying to achieve and why you would be a good fit for the particular program. Um, and, you know, th and there's, there is relative importance here, and, and, and it, there's often a question of, you know, well, what if my GPA is lower? Well, for example, we don't look at always just overall GPA. We will look at GPA in specific courses that we think are really key foundational courses for us. This is coming from statistics, for example. So if we're looking at somebody and we're looking at their calculus scores, their linear algebra scores, their real analysis scores, for example, we want to say, OK, this person is clearly understanding these subjects. Um, now, we also like them to be well-rounded, so obviously a higher GPA is always going to be helpful. But again, those are kind of the main criteria that we would be looking for. Similar things occur on the GRE sides. I think a lot of people apply to us and they think, well, as long as I've got a high analytic or quantitative GRE score, and to give you an idea, we generally are kind of looking minimum 90 percentile and above on those types of things. But we also look at verbal scores. Um, we want to know if people can communicate. And we're also trying to get that from the letter writing as well. And it's an important part of all sciences. Um, and when we're looking for graduate students, we want them to be able to communicate. So I'm going to stop there. there. There are some other caveats to this question. It's a very long question in terms of taking time off. We can, we can discuss this a little bit more as we could. Um, thank you, Dan. You have answered some of the questions. <laughs> so the question I have is, um, who should I ask to for um, to be my you know, letter writers? So I started from the last sub question, uh, which is um, the only thing my letter writers know about me is that I got an A in their class. Is that enough? No, definitely no. It's a, you know, but you know this is uh, the situation that I mean a lot of uh, time. I mean, you know, all the time I should say. A lot of time I received a you know request saying that you know professor I need a letter could you please write me a letter I got an A I really knew nothing about that so what can I write a very generic one I sometimes I say no I don't know you pretty well sometimes the students told me you know I really need a letter to show that you know I'm able to do math well to do style well okay I wrote the letter but I really didn't have much to say. So what should you do? So um, maybe you know if it's, it might be too late. So the best way that you know to get interaction to talk with the professor when you were t when you were taking the course, because let the um, professor know you know what are your interest in, uh, what you know, so you can also get help. But you know if you have already taken the course, you can still um, talk with the professor, make appointment, say that you know. I want to uh, apply this program, you know, or you know, um, right? I want to get a master or PhD in which direction. I need a ladder, so can we talk? You know, I can uh, introduce uh, myself a little bit more to you, so that you know me more. So, um, you know, um, so it's great. It's uh, it's not enough, though, so because it's really hard to write a ladder. There's nothing to write except a few sentences. Um, so. Um, what can I uh, what can I do to get a stronger letters of a recommendation? So, which is related to, to the first one. Um, so, the instructor needs to know you well in order to write a good letter for you. Of course, you, you also need to do well uh, in courses. So, uh, how many how many letters do I need? I think typically three is good enough. Um, so, if you have three good letters, uh, that should be good. Four, maybe it's also good. But probably you don't need more than that. Two is probably not enough. So three or four, you know, um, that is uh, my experience. So the last part is um, who should I ask for letters, lectures, you know, industry books. Um, so in my opinion, you should look for you know um, people working in academia 
and who know you. For example, instructors. It could be a regular course, like you know, you took a regular course for a person, um, and you know, um, it would be preferred if the course is relevant to the program. As Dan said, you know, so if you're looking at uh, a um, STEM program, so what do we look for? We're probably not that interested in history, not in music courses, but maybe math, you know, upper division STEM courses, uh, they are more relevant. Um, how about industry books? So we do see letters, of, you know, from industry books. If you have a working experience, you know, to have a letter, from um, an industry book that works. But you know, you shouldn't allow all the letters uh, to be from industry person. Because we want to see your, uh, you know, your performance in courses, not only you know, your, your ability to be a good team player. So um, that is my uh, opinion. Um, so in terms of you know, who you should look for, you can also you know, ask the people who uh, you did individual studies with. For example, that person, although you know, didn't uh, teach you, um, but it knows your ability in research, things like that. Thank you. So my question is, can I really get paid to go to graduate school? Uh, yes and no. So if you're in the PhD program, maybe yes, a little bit, barely enough to live. If your master's program, no. So PhD programs, master's program almost never, but PhD programs usually, it's very from school to school, but certainly in our department, if we admit you, then we're gonna guarantee you can afford to live for, I don't know, for maybe six years, we have some limit, okay? So when I say afford to live, your tuition's paid, plus we give you some meager stipend where if you have a roommate and you don't need a good car, maybe you can barely get by while you're getting your degree, okay? So when you get paid, you're not getting paid, you're like living, right? That's PhD though. And that's not true in every department. Like I know departments on these campus where it, that's not the case, right? They, they give you, they say, well, we'll give you a year of money and you gotta find the rest on your own, okay? But most, most departments are gonna guarantee you money for at least a good number of years. You may have to work for that money. You may have to be a TA. Uh, in fact, generally you will have to be a TA for some period of time, probably, depending on the package you get, but you'll get that money. Uh, master's program, generally that's not gonna happen. You're just gonna have to pay to do master's. And can I plan to work half-time in a PhD program or in a master's program? PhD, please do not do that. Uh, people may have different opinions, but don't do that, man. That is so, I hate, in fact, I won't take a student who's working half-time for a PhD student for working for me, because I just don't believe it can be done. But it is theoretically possible, okay? There's no hard and fast rule against it. It's just that I know that if a student is working half-time, they're probably gonna be less productive, and then I won't be getting good research out of them, and that's not what I want. But that's maybe me. There are other more kindly faculty who will say, okay, you know, <laughs> but I'm kind of like that. So it, it, masters, yeah, you could do that as a masters. It might take you an extra year to graduate or something like that, but you could do that. Thank you. I, I would say, though, that as a PhD student, I thought it was the, the, the richest I've been in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to, to see so many people here are interested in looking into graduate school, ma master's programs, and PhD students, uh, prospective students. Uh, let's see, my question is very similar to the one that Professor Gillen had. What do the very top tier schools look for? I don't think they look for anything different from any research program. It's basically a variety of, of, of uh, perspectives that they, they use to evaluate your applications. And you basically paint a picture when you apply. Uh, certainly your GPA and the courses that you take is part of the picture. Uh, the extent to which uh, you can demonstrate creativity and independent thinking and, and passion for doing things on your own as opposed to being told what to do. I think that's important, uh, especially in the PhD program, you will have to take initiatives and you will have to go through some difficult years and it's really your own uh, fortitude that will keep you going for all this all this year. So we are looking for ways to assess that and we're looking for independent projects. If you publish that project, that's that's great. We're looking for people's opinions, folks and faculty who worked with you, uh, either had you in a class and you showed interest in the class or, or, or did an independent project with them. So we want to, to, to read what these people think about you. And we, yeah, we're gonna look at GREs and all these things having your theories in the 90th, 95th percentile will not hurt, but at the same time, it's not going to guarantee anything. 
I have a sub question here. What if I apply only to top tier schools and they all turn me down? It probably means that you didn't pay attention to your probability class, right? Because <laughs> the chances of getting into any school, top tier or not top tier, is, is between zero and one, but not zero or one. So with probability less than one, you may not get, uh, with probability greater than zero, you may not get in, into any school, no matter what school you apply. So you diversify, you have a broad portfolio. I remember when I was applying, Nine out of ten places were on the west coast, one of was on the east coast. I ended up going to the place on the east coast. That shows you, right, uh, what probabilities can do for you. But, but you have to diversify. You want the rich schools, you want the schools that are kind of safe. <coughs> and you go, you go, you, you, you give your best shot at your application. That's my 60 seconds. Thank you. Um, so my question is, uh, what about interdisciplinary options? Um, I assume that uh, all of you are ICS majors. So uh, ICS has, uh, has evolved over time as to be uh, extremely interdisciplinary. So uh, being an interdisciplinary uh, researcher and a student who has uh, some experience in other areas <coughs> is uh, extremely useful. Um, that would also, uh, you have to choose your graduate schools appropriately so that uh, uh, there, are, there are schools who are uh, probably traditionally interdisciplinary <coughs> in nature. For example, our school, ICS, is very interdisciplinary. Um, so you may have to do some homework in choosing the graduate schools that you would like to apply to where there are strengths in both computer science and whatever the other discipline that you want to uh, work on. So what are the good interdisciplinary combinations for computer science grad school? The biggest one is uh, uh, biological sciences, now, this age. Um, if you are uh, left brain, then you say biological sciences and computer science. Uh, if you are right brain, then you say art and computer science. So uh, the spectrum of interdisciplinary uh, activities and research that can go on with uh, ICS is huge, starting from all the way from art to uh, very strong uh, science, uh, biological sciences. So, so we have in this uh, school at least we have both sides, art and uh, art, all the way from art to cognitive sciences to anthropology, in informatics department, all the way to biological sciences in the computer science department. <coughs> Will it hurt to apply for grad school in a, in a different discipline, engineering or music? Absolutely not. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt you at all. Uh, in fact, it might strengthen in certain cases if you have a computer science background and if you have uh, uh, some sort of exposure to other disciplines. Uh, especially, it doesn't definitely it doesn't affect engineering, applying to engineering, because in most uh, campuses, uh, computer science is part of the engineering school and they expect you to apply to engineering school. Uh, and within the engineering school, people might uh, move around uh, to different disciplines. Uh, so I had a strong interest from mechanical engineering and computer science also. So I had some minor courses I took in mechanical engineering and then I moved to computer science after that. And in fact, in my PhD, I uh, touched upon mechanical engineering quite a bit. So engineering and computer science, it's not an issue. Uh, music and computer science, of course, uh, you should have uh, read the book uh, God Elisha Bach and then there are plenty of uh, overlap in music and computer science. Um, uh, there is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, biological systems and computer science. Um, so a minor would definitely help. That shows your additional interest and then uh, that shows to the admissions committee that you have some background in the other disciplines, uh, this, their particular discipline that you are interested in and the computer science background. That really, really helps. Should I get a master's or PhD in computer science if I later plan on getting an MBA and uh, going into management? If you really want to go into management, uh, eventually, PhD might not be that useful. Uh, you might want to just go with masters. Um, you want to, you may want to do masters because uh, the job opportunities are very high uh, for masters in computer science than for bachelors in computer science. And after that, you can still do masters in uh, uh, MBA, master management MBA. But doing PhD, if you really want to do management, is not that useful. Okay. So uh, that's all I have questions here.
Thank you very much. And before we move on, I'd like to uh, calibrate the room. Who here thinks they uh, might want to get a PhD? And who here thinks they might want to get a master's, but they're sure they don't want to get a PhD? <laughs> and who's kind of undecided at this point? Okay, great. So now I'd like to open it to uh, faculty discussion among the panel to elaborate. I don't, I don't know if I need that. <laughs> Just big outdoor voices. I, I, I can do that too. That's easy. Um, I, I just want to make a couple comments on, on, on certain things, and I tend to agree with everything that was said, but I'll just add maybe some, some extra dynamics here. So in terms of interdisciplinary, you know, I'm going to put in a plug for my own field. So you know, a lot of folks that are coming in from computer science, statistics is a great interdisciplinary degree. I think a lot of you guys have started to hear the terminology data science. You know, the way that we are moving these days is collecting massive amounts of data, so and then drawing conclusions, scientific conclusions, formulating hypotheses, etc., from those data. That takes a very special skill set. It takes somebody that is extremely good at computing, good at databases, good at algorithms, but also took the probability class and paid attention <laughs> to it, um, as the dean was just noting there. Um, but, and, and far more statistics beyond that. And so that is, in my mind, an area of field, if you look at the demand, you know, uh, you, know you can quote over and over again, look at Glassdoor, it's the number one job <coughs> in the country, both in terms of pay, both in terms of supply versus demand, both in terms of, and also in terms of job satisfaction, et cetera, it's going to continue to grow. It's not going away anytime soon. So think about that if you're, if you're kind of, of working along those lines. And then there, another thing that I did want to mention um, just briefly is, you know, again, we, we do pay attention to, to folks that are coming from other disciplines oftentimes. You know, I mean, I, I can quote right now, I actually just this morning got through writing a postdoc letter of reference for one of our students that's getting a PhD, his bachelor's degree was in German and classical languages. Um, and so that goes to show what he was able to do in his application for us though. He obviously <coughs> had foundational mathematics there and he did a good job there, but he also showed in his letters that he had a very broad and clear <coughs> understanding of what he was getting into in our program and he's done extremely well. So can you do this? Yes. Is it the easiest route oftentimes? Maybe not. but. Um, it certainly can be done. So don't rule those things out as you're moving around. So. I just wanted to add one thing too. I agree with Dan about data analytics as a wonderful field that brings in a lot of what you can learn here. But the other thing is there's some questions here about prestige. And I know when you're an undergrad, you're very conscious of what does it mean to go to a prestigious school. And I just want to delineate that the higher you get in your education, the more tailored what it means to be prestigious is. So at undergrad, something about you, know, you get into Harvard and that means everything. At the PhD level, there are actually some programs at Harvard that aren't that great. And so at the, it, when you, the higher you get master's and PhD, the more the prestige is based on the quality of the program, which is oftentimes aligned with the quality of the school together, but not entirely. It's not a perfect fit. So what you're looking at at that point is the prestige of the individual program less than or in conjunction with the prestige <coughs> of the entire university. So just to put that out there. I think at this point, uh, in order to ensure that questions get answered, I'd like to open the uh, session to questions from the floor. Please. Uh, so looking at the graduate application online, I saw that they asked for three uh, letters of recommendation, <coughs> two being academic sources. So I was wondering, would uh, a third letter from someone who's really not affiliated at all with your area, not even someone who knows you very well, be inappropriate, or is that a good course of action? Um, so what can you, uh, what can, uh, what can ladders are you talking about from a, like an industry book, you know? So no, totally outside of the industry. I'm going to outside of, so you know, out, like also outside question. of academia, right? Huh? Also outside of the academia. So yeah, totally outside of academia. So you know, does uh, that person have any, any relationship with you? Had any interactions <coughs> with you, or you know, that a person doesn't know know you at all? Well, what I'm saying is that someone who knows you really well, really uh, well. over the past like couple of years, but yeah. is not related at all to Tasmania. So say you already have two letters from professors who know you, but now this is someone else who's not really affiliated with your study, but knows you as a person. 
Yeah, you know, if the um, if the research area of that professor, you know, is related, and you know, you talked with that person, or even did an individual study, or you know, knows your personality, knows your capability, um, so you know, he knows you well, he knows your potential, it still works. Uh, um, it's still relevant. To I, I would also just qualify that, as, as Dan and people have been saying, we care about people who have fortitude, who can get know what they're getting into, have persistence. So I wouldn't have maybe an aunt or an uncle write you a letter, but someone who can speak to your character along the dimensions that are going to help you be successful in grad school. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That would be, I think, a really good student athlete. Yeah, coach is fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> coach I mean, is fine. I mean, and, 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 and coach yeah. can speak. So again, you want to choose people that can speak to very specific attributes that you have. So, like in sports, it's resilience, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's a big part of this. It's sure. determination, and so. That Being is a huge part. I, I often describe graduate school as academic boot camp. You've got to have resilience and determination. And, and you've got to be self driven. You where you go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. Another question. Thank you. Please. Uh, so, I guess I have a background really common with the, all the questions some people ask. So, I graduated from econ and minor in computer science, and I work for public accounting. But my heart always say me I want to do comp side now. So I go back and now I decide to do computer science like master. Uh, one of the questions is that, so now until the deadline for application, which was December 15, I do not take GIE yet, and there's other things that I need to prepare to make my application stronger. So what is the piece of advice for me? If like, for example, a letter of recommendation for me is for the partner in the business, not like from engineering or uh, one, things like that, in GIE I need to take and stuff like that. So in order to make my application, application stronger compared to other students who come from engineering or computer science, what should I do? Other questions? <laughs> we all go quiet. No, I think it was actually in much of what we said, right? Okay. I, I think you're looking for a strategy to stand out or yes. a strategy to advertise yourself and and in some ways just being yourself mm -hmm. um, and especially in your personal statement explaining your journey um, <coughs> why you're taking this journey what are you hoping to learn okay. why do you think this institution is the right institution for you to take that okay. um, and then you know, you might even contact a graduate affairs office somewhere at, at that institution and, and say, look, I'm applying, any, any advice that you have, you know, can I maybe reach out to a faculty member there? So, so I think it, don't try to, try to look for like the, the, the magic key that, yeah. that uh -huh. takes your application higher than everybody else because as soon as I tell that, everybody else here will do the same thing. And so it, it really doesn't exist, yeah. right? Yeah. But talking about yourself and your journey uh -huh. and why you want to do this okay. um, and how you've prepared yourself for it, that goes a long way. Um, together with, you know, what have your scores been and how did you do on the GRE? But, um, it, it's to me, it's really the, the personal statement, the okay. letters. Um, that that is what I pay attention to first. I, I, I would summarize: the more you know yourself, uh -huh. and the more you know where you want to go and why. Okay. So actually thinking about the different degrees and what do they have to offer, and why would that? Why am I excited about these different places? The more you can actually take the time to to, to get those two storylines straight, the stronger your application is going to be for the different schools. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I'll just. Chime in with one other thing, and, and different disciplines I think are treat this differently, and that's why I kind of hesitated to let the CS folks maybe opine on this. But so, for example, people that are coming to us from different fields, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, we kind of have very core foundational classes that tend to be good precursors to how well people are going to do in higher level probability and theory, right? So when for example. So we're more than happy to entertain folks that are coming from different fields. And in fact, we love that diversity. I mean, that, that diversity in thought is good for our field and it's good for our students. But we also need to know that they have kind of foundational skills that are going to allow them to succeed too. We don't want to bring somebody in without having that because it makes it very difficult for them at the end of the day. And so you want to think about what are those core aspects of CS, for example. You may have been focusing on econ. Um, but what, what is your core training in CS? And then you know, make sure that that is highlighted in your application. Yeah, I agree with you know, what everybody has said. We 
did have a you know a case last year. A student was in the uh, accounting major, you know, a major that didn't do a lot of you know mathematics or statistics. But we saw that she did really well in the limited number of you know mathematics course she did. She showed her passion in her statement about the statistics. And so we admitted her. I think you know she's going to do it really well. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> So same way, actually, the, uh -huh. uh, the minor uh -huh. would really help yes. uh, in uh, transferring to a different uh, field yeah. from computer science. Yeah. Uh, right. Because that's exactly what uh, Professor Gillen said. We do look for the basic courses yeah. to see how interested that particular student is mm -hmm. and how successful the particular student is in our program. And that's exactly what other areas and fields, they also would do that. If you have a minor uh -huh. in, say, bio computer science, minor in biological sciences, uh -huh. when you apply to uh -huh. biological sciences, they will see at least you have shown interest, you have performed well, so you are OK to be in their program. There was a hand here. Oh. Yes. Um, so I would like to ask your opinion on just a comparison. So one would be attending grad school right after, right after graduating from undergrad, and one would be graduate from undergrad, take a few years to work, and then go decide to apply to grad school then. Um, what differences do you think it, um, it would make? Like app, or how you view things? So I can chime in. It's part, it's, it was part of my question, which is the way it was listed on here, does it hurt to take time off between undergraduate and graduate schools in terms of applications and admissions? Um, my answer to that is no. Um, in fact, sometimes it, <laughs> we really like to see that because it means that you have a perspective on the field that you've learned while you've been out. Again, it's this idea of, I think a lot of folks that maybe can go from straight from undergrad into graduate school, I was one of those folks, but oftentimes you don't really know necessarily what you're really getting into right away. Whereas if you've been out working, sometimes you go, okay, these are the reasons why I want to get a master's degree. These are the reasons why I want to have a PhD and do that independent fundamental <laughs> research to drive the field forward. And so those things often come across very, very well in an application because you can see what the motivation is behind somebody as they're coming through. So I don't think it's a bad idea at all. Again, I went the other route. I went kind of straight from undergrad to graduate school, and, and that worked out as well. And I, so I, I think you could go either way. I don't think it's going to hurt you to have taken time off and worked, um, for example. I I say, go right ahead. Uh, you want to be careful that you go down that path because after a couple of years, being a student is not easy, by the way. You know that, right? <laughs> After a couple of years, you quote unquote lose it, and you don't have the appetite to go back to school. Some other times, you do have much more of an appetite to go back to school because you see how working in industry is, and you get it out of your system, and then you want to go back to school because it was so much fun, right? So you have to be <coughs> able to manage yourself really during that transitional period. Okay. And I'll join in. Um, for myself, after I graduated from undergraduate, I worked for a year to save money, and then I spent the next year going around the world, and then spent the next 15 years in the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and that worked very well for me. Uh, I agreed no more than two years, and if you do that, ask your professors to write their letters now, while they know you and you're fresh in your mind, and save them on the file, rather than come back two years later and, oh, yes, I think I remember that person them to write their letters and save them now. It's now uh, 11.50. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to excuse the faculty panel. Some of them have uh, classes they have to go to. And then we'll have a graduate student panel. Please thank the faculty panel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, graduate student panel is in panel. Please give them your attention. Um, I'm going to ask first if you just go down the row and introduce yourself uh, where you're from, and then I'll ask you to go down the row again, and in 60 seconds or less, the single most important thing you have to tell these students about graduate school and getting in that hasn't already been said by somebody in front of you. So please go ahead and start to introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Francis. I am a transfer graduate student from another program. I followed my advisor here. Um, I'm an informatics PhD program, and I have a previous background experience of an undergraduate in psychology. Uh, I'm Rain Forrest. I checked. 
Um, I am an international student. I'm from Montreal, Canada. I'm doing a PhD here, but I have a background of already having a master's, uh, so I can potentially speak to you know doing one and then the other. Uh, and I, the other thing, uh, PhD in informatics, first year. Uh, hi, I'm Sam McDonald, and I'm a second year PhD in informatics. Um, I did my undergrad in information systems at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Yao, um, second year PhD student in informatics. Um, I had a previous background in speech therapy um, at UT Austin, and I worked as a speech therapist for two years before coming back to uh, school. Hey, I'm Tim. I am a fifth year grad student in computer science. I did my bachelor's in math at Caltech. Hi, um, I'm Abhidnya. I'm an international student, second year master's uh, in computer science. I also had a background in computer engineering and research. Uh, my name is Khan. I'm a fifth year PhD student in computer science. Uh, I have a long history with UCI. I transferred here to my bachelor, and then after the bachelor, I stayed here until now. So uh, it's been quite a long time. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Aprajita and I'm also an international student. So I did my bachelor's in computer engineering back in India. And now I'm a master's first year informatics student. And well, I worked in between for two years. For, so for the questions, we're switching from work. That would really be, uh, like I can help you guys with that. Hi everyone, I'm Eric. I'm a fifth year PhD student. Uh, I specialize in machine learning. I'm um, in the computer science department. Uh, and uh, I did my undergrad in Pennsylvania studying computer science and uh, English. Hi, my name is Shu. I'm a fourth year PhD student here. Uh, I've been working in computer science domain for 12 years. I've been exploring a lot of things. I'm happy to answer any questions here. So I'd like to begin at this end again and in 60 seconds or less, just bullet point. Um, the most important thing you think these students should hear that hasn't already been said by someone before you? Uh, making a really strong connection to the program you're applying to. So if, you're, if there's a specific mentor or advisor you want to work with, setting up like a, a physical interview if you can, talking with them before the program, talking to them before <coughs> you apply to the program, getting these lines of uh, communication set up. So when you apply, you're not applying as just a blank applicant, but you're applying with a genuine connection to the program. Uh, I mean, people have been sort of saying this in various ways, but I'll just say it directly. Like, grad school is not as scary or threatening or difficult as you might think it is. It's obviously a challenge, and it's a big chunk of your life at this point if you decide you want to devote two or even five or six years to studying something. But if it's something that you would all think that you want to do, and you start exploring the various options afforded to you, and you, you like what you see, then odds are that you will be completely fine and that once you find yourself in a place that works for you and that you can work within, it is not a sudden huge paradigm shift where your life becomes really hard all of a sudden. So it's not something to shy away from. Um, for applying to grad school, I'd say the biggest thing for me was really connecting with the advisor that you want to work with and being really open and coherent about what you want to do and how you want to do it and maybe you don't know yet but still be confident in your skills and abilities and really flaunt what you can offer to the school and the community and to your advisor um, and that could really shine in your application in terms of looking at your strengths um, and just really flaunt them and own them because it's what they want. Um, I really recommend uh, if you're applying for a PhD program um, definitely look at what um, the researchers are doing at the universities and really try to reach out to them ahead of time. Um, having that in connection, really telling them you know what they're doing and why you're going for the program really means a lot. If you're applying for a master degree, which I've also done before, um, knowing that it's a lot different than PhD, you have similar set curriculum, as long as you fulfill your requirement, you'll be good for the degree. But PhD is a lot different. so. There are um, opportunities for both, so make sure you know what you're looking for. And then apply for different levels of schools. Don't just bang on, um, bet your all, all your chances to the top tier schools and really stagger it yourself. So I think one of the important things to know about a PhD is you don't have to be a super genius to do it. It's actually much more useful to be a hard worker and persistent 
because it's more about perseverance than about being super smart. And I've seen, like, from my friends that have gone to grad school, the people who have actually been successful in PhDs, it's not always who I expected it to be. So. So I cannot say more about PhDs because I'm a master's student, but um, if you really want to go to your graduate school immediately after you're done with undergrad, I would suggest don't be afraid, and it's not that bad of an idea as long as, like, you have worked on a few things while you were an undergrad or researched on a few things, your application to grad school, like master's, is going to be good and you're going to be fine. And don't be worried that you don't have a work experience before applying for master's and you're just directly going from undergrad to grad. Uh, so I think the most important thing is that you're open to any chances that you might get into. So uh, for example, if you're a sophomore right now, you might want, even though if you don't think about going to PhD right now, you might want to uh, get in touch with some labs to do some sort of research projects. Because who knows, uh, when you do the research project, you might get convinced or you might get interested in doing PhD later. That's my case. I get into a research project and then uh, my advisor at that point, my, um, yeah, the professor at that point successfully convinced me to go to a PhD, even though I don't have that plan when I'm about to graduate my bachelor. So yeah, be open for anything. Uh, my advice would be to start <coughs> early because um, like if you're an international student, you have a lot of exams to go through like GRE and TOEFL and all that. And then you have to get the transcripts in place. You have to talk to your recommenders, like for the letter of recommendations. And the most important thing I felt <coughs> is the statement of purpose. You really need time to reflect upon what you want to do, and exactly you should. You have to like connect the dots and know where you want to go, and be clear about uh, why you want to do it. And if you just put honest thoughts into your statement of purpose, I think that would get you in like honest and like a uh, systematic approach of what you did before and how, why do you want to pursue it further on and all that. So it's a really good uh, thing to like start <coughs> early and then go on about it. Uh, yeah, my number one tip for, I'll speak to a PhD, is just to have curiosity and that kind of flows through everything that everyone said. I think like in terms of like making connections with professors at conferences or through email or making connections with professors that uh, you're taking classes with and even like writing your apps and you know exhibiting curiosity is like the number one trait of I think of a good uh, PhD student so if if you don't feel innately curious about a subject I wouldn't get a PhD in it or at least not for the time being until you learn more about it um, you know I see I saw a lot of people that were like really smart and did uh, really academically well like go to you know grad school and then they just kind of we're doing it because they were good at school or because their family got graduate degrees and not because they really liked it to the degree to like, you know, pound your head against the wall for days on end, which is sometimes <laughs> the case when you do uh, research. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, you should always ask yourself in all these interactions, like, are you, uh, you know, just be curious and like, don't be afraid to ask you know, dumb questions. I think like a lot of the times I would be afraid to uh, talk to a professor because I'd like sound dumb or something. And um, you know they kind of expect you to sound dumb, like you know they don't expect an undergrad or, or a, you know a first or second year master student to really you know be able to you know have like these innovative you know really groundbreaking ideas. But just the fact that you're showing interest and curiosity, it's it's like ninety percent of the way. Um, what I want to share is that a master program is a good place that you can think deeply about yourself what you want, whether you want to make a change. Um, of course, in master program, you will take more courses, harder ones, and but you also have opportunity to do some research with uh, senior graduate students or PhD students or the professors. Uh, then you can find out uh, whether you want to keep doing this because the PhD is not a, just a word; it's just a, a life, a living s status. Um, it's about uh, getting stuck. All, all, all the time, <laughs> think about new ideas to solve the problem, or even finding new problem to solve, then benefit the world and the human life. Uh, yeah, just do more, take your time. I've been to Hong Kong before applying for a PhD student uh, program because I, I didn't have time to, to do the 
GRE exam. Uh, yeah, I, I have so much delays. But anyway, it turns out that I find something I love. That's all, all you need. I'd now like to open it to discussion among the panels to elaborate on some of these points. Big outdoor voices. <laughs> I'll come in on one. Um, so I really like what you said in terms of like knowing like who's going to pursue or persevere throughout the PhD and who's not. It really is a curiosity and a perseverance endeavor for your PhD. Like you can be the smartest person in the world and you're not going to finish because no one's telling you what to do at your PhD. Like your advisor's sort of guiding you, but in terms of like your research and getting everything done and keeping up with TA and getting your funding, getting your grants, no one's telling you to do any of those things. So it's really up to you and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis that really matters um, because it's such an individualized process. So making sure that if you guys are considering PhD, like know that like you have to be self-driven because no one else is going to tell you to finish your PhD when or how. So. At the same time, if you want to do graduate school and you don't right now have an idea <coughs> for a project, that's okay because most programs with a master's it can be a bit more fast-paced like they really kind of get you in and get you out in a certain way but especially with a PhD you kind of have your whole first year to take courses and figure out sort of where your interests lie I mean at UCI in particular we're given an intern sort of supervisor who we meet with and talk about how we're feeling about the program about sort of ideas we might have and if they happen to be the person that's best for you to work with, then that's great. But you know, you may take a class with someone else and really click with them, and you know, maybe change advisors or bring them on as part of your committee. So part of it is also not to feel the pressure to say, oh, I need to know exactly what my project is going to be. Because even I know people who, even in a master's, in like January of their second year, so like several months before their thesis is due, they change their mind and start it over. And that's not recommended by any means, but if you feel ultimately you should go with what interests you, because if you're just doing something, uh, someone on the other end said similarly, like if you're just doing it because you feel like you ought to, or you should, or people are pressuring you to, then the research that you produce and the work that you produce is not going to be as high quality as if it's something that you really wanted to do. Yeah, I think I totally uh, like get his point that he said that as an undergrad you might not be very clear about what your interest is. so. You know, going for a master's and you know, like uh, getting a bit more deeper into things and uh, more research about opportunities with senior grad students, and that that all really helps. And uh, I'm very sure that you know, uh, once you're in the master's program, you'll probably uh, be more clear about what your interest is, and uh, you know, then you can think about going for a PhD, which needs a lot of. Uh, like perseverance over that topic or maybe your field of interest that you're taking in as a PhD uh, topic. So I think I totally agree with him what he said. Yeah, and, and so it, it came up a couple times both being curious about things, being interested, kind of finding like your voice as well as connecting to the professionals in the field. Um, I can't recommend or can't emphasize how important it is to really identify what you want to do um, when you get into one of these programs, you really want a good fit between your, your goals, your interests, um, and the people you're going to be spending your career with, potentially. Um, so if you're thinking about whether it's computer science or informatics, game studies, health uh, design for applications, find these conferences in your area, find networking events where the people are going to be and go talk with them, meet with them, because these are the people that you're going to be spending your time with, especially in, in your PhD. When you're writing when you're researching, when you're theorizing. Um, so before you even like jump into a PhD program, start interacting with that those fields of professionals uh, and make sure there's a good fit and there's a like, good passion there. Um, it also then makes finding potential letter writers helpful. Um, I had someone that I met at a conference uh, actually write a letter for me. We um, networked a couple weeks after the conference and did this cool little project, a uh, little website we made. Um, and then he wrote a letter for me. And I think that was kind of like this really cool moment where I was able to interact with the field have that connect to the program that I was in. Um, another tip I had was um, I'd say like start writing a blog, or again this is for a PhD, uh, 
writing a blog and putting your code on GitHub, like that's the best way to kind of show off the work that you do. You know, like, uh, you know, a professor recommendation can only capture what you did in their class, or their, even if your class project was so great, like they can only, you know, the, the writing kind of uh, uh, can only capture it so well. And if you can put the class project on GitHub and, and uh, and uh, you know, write about it in your blog. You know, you might think it's you know, kind of simple, but it still like shows again like good traits that are necessary for doing research and explaining. Uh, kind of the next step is like explaining what you're doing to other people and for like wider release. So that's <coughs> an easy thing to do, but that helps a lot. Of Something else. Um I cannot anticipate uh, about researchers. There are a lot more writing you have to do. Um, basically, uh, as a knowledge producer, instead of doing projects, you take ownership of actually generating, articulating what you're working on into scholarly, publishable quality uh, research works. So there are a lot of, um, it doesn't matter whether you're computer science or like stats, you have to actually articulate what you've learned and produce new knowledge and feed it back to the ecosystem. So there's a lot of writing, and so that really requires you to be self-disciplined, really enjoy kind of the process of going through what's beyond what I'm thinking and make sure everyone understands and then like have um, these work being presentable. So a lot of that is very different than a master's student. Um, you might be taking classes, doing class paper, but the requirement of what you're producing is not as high. So um, it's also very great to just if you have a particular field you're interested, say, data science is very popular, you want to get yourself into it, start reading um, topics that you're really interested in. A lot of times, your ideas come from those scholarly writing readings, which you probably hate as a student um, because there's too many of them and it's overwhelming. Um, another channel of um, how you want to figure out what you wanted to do is actually really go back to industry and get some uh, years of work experience. Um, I'm always very provocative of, um, like, I advocate getting at some practical work experience so you can go out and there and see what can computer science solve in the real world problem, in game, in health, in education. And then when you come back to the field, you're more compassionate about that particular topic. That's what's driving you to actually finish up your degree. It's not. Um, you know, the frame of being a PhD candidate or, uh, you know, having the potential of being a future faculty, those will not be motivating as, um, as motivated as having the intrinsic uh, passion about what you wanted to do. I have a small advice of don't apply to 15 colleges like I did. It's <laughs> not worth it. <laughs> But also apply to more than four, apply like I did. Don't apply so. to many. You don't do it. Yeah, so, so th I, this was going to come I only applied to one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got in. But, but I think one of the things that you can consider is um, every person has, like, a different path to kind of walk, right? And, and what's going to make sense for you. There was one advisor that I just, like, I loved his work. I needed to work with this person. Um, so I actually applied for a research grant at that institution as an undergrad. I was able to go there and network with them, hang out. Um, I was able to you know, meet all of his graduate students and sit in on a couple of their meetings. So I was able to see like, the interactions there. Um, and it was just like this really cool experience. Uh, that is an option. That is a way you can get into a program is by you know, researching at the institution or like, literally asking that, uh, that advisor, hey, can I you know, work with your team? Can I sit in on a few meetings? Can I see what it's like to be a graduate student? Um, so kind of thinking outside the box, but uh, I wouldn't recommend just applying to one. It was really stressful, <laughs> right? Because all your eggs are in one basket. But my alternative plan was then to go into industry, mm -hmm. so to get experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think it really helps if you also research the location of the institution. I'm not saying let's all go to Southern California because it's nice and with beach and sunshine. <laughs> but um, I was very particular in choosing schools. I did my. Um, master in like Austin and then like PhD here and then my undergrad in San Diego. Um, not just because the places are nice, these are all like bigger metropolitan uh, and large schools with a lot more to offer. Um, like if you're particularly interested in say uh, being in the industry as a computer scientist, a developer, um, even going to a um, California State University like the CSU San Jose State, they actually got more students admitted to nearby um, high-tech companies, they're as, as equally popular um, compared to like a lot of very elite schools. If financial, that's also a consideration. 
and um, I know like for international students there are additional considerations of okay after I finish my degree there is visa and like being working uh, able to work in the states for like uh, H1Bs and all that uh, having the STEM degree is really helpful but they don't really if it's a master as long as you have the degree it doesn't matter if it's like STEM for master or like San Jose State master they count equally as like a master degree so so another thing I think that uh, when you decide to go to grad school then try to build up your support network especially if you're international student because you are here alone so uh, what I mean by support network, it, it could include your advisor, your classmates, your friends that you make in, within school. Uh, otherwise, grad school is extremely stressful, unfortunately. So uh, there will be time that you, you find difficulties that even your advisor or your lab mates or anybody, like somebody not within your circle of, of known of, of, of relationship can help you. So you might need to reach out and I think like, at least, have, <coughs> at least over here, the school has counseling center that you can go to, and then you can vent your anger to somebody else <laughs> that are trained to do so. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Something I did during my application process was like go to the website, and you have all the classmates listed down. If, like in informatics, who are who are the students that are taking the masters, the PhD students. So I, I like sent a couple of mails to some people. And they really are responsive. They help you. They respond back. And if you have specific doubts on which courses I should take, which courses are projects, so that I have hands-on experience. So they really came back to me. And then also the faculty, they respond really fast, because they know your application deadline is like 15 December, and then you have to make decisions. <coughs> so you should do that. You should like find people who are in UCI, shoot a mail or something, and shoot your questions right away. Yeah, and sort of on that, even if they're a professor, don't be weirded out. Like, I know it can feel weird to just, like, send an email in the void to a really well-known scholar in your field. Maybe, like, you read something that they wrote or something like that, and it kind of, it feels like mailing, like, a celebrity, if you want, or something like that, where you're just like, oh, dear so-and-so, whose book I've read and who was really famous in this discipline. Um, if they're at a university that you think you want to go to or you think you want to work with them, then the way I started with my master's, I was kind of in the same situation as Francis, where I only applied to one because I was already there and stuff, but that's the exception more than the rule. So for a PhD, I applied to a variety, keeping in mind that it can be expensive to apply to too many, but wanting to apply to more than just one. Um, and I started out by sending emails to 15 or so schools, and then from the response that I got from, or the lack of response, that's also telling anyway. <laughs> yeah. If you email someone and they don't get back to you, or you have to like bug someone to bug them to get back to you, then you know that maybe, not even necessarily that like that speaks ill of the department, but maybe they as a supervisor are very busy, and that can give you an indication of what your working relationship might be with them. And if you're someone that wants a bit of input here and there, that might, it's, it's all up to what you want, but um, suffice to say that shooting out those emails to those people that you've never met before, this is part of the job, especially is, you know, fielding <coughs> questions from prospective grad students, figuring out with them whether you'd be a good fit uh, either to work with them or even just to be in the department. And then from there, whittling down to, I did seven, but I mean, there's no exact number that's perfect for anyone. But then applying to, like, some of those that feel the most reasonable to you and seeing what sticks. And then if you're lucky enough to get into more than one, you get to compare sort of the offers they give you if you're a PhD student and things like that. And it gives you, it's good to have some choice and it's good to have as much context going in as possible. So again, don't be afraid to shoot out emails to random big name scholars. But use the right pronouns because I was on the elevator with Jillian Hayes on the way up here and she was talking about how she got a potential grad student looking at GCI was like, dear sir. Do your research. Do your research. <laughs> and it's just basic gender of the professor that you want to work with. Well, and I'll, I'll chime in. Also, be very careful if you're doing this for multiple schools and copying and pasting. <laughs> I, received, I would love to work with Professor Richard Lathrop at the University of Texas, Austin. <laughs> Yeah, I really have a, a really nice story to share. Like one of my friends who was really interested in the research of a professor in Georgia Tech, and 
he apparently like sent a lot of emails to him but he's like a very well known professor and he wasn't getting any response so what he did was like he just googled the uh, students who used to work in his lab and uh, kind of mailed them and you know uh, one of them responded to him and he sent his resume and he said that my like the research I've done during undergrad is very much in line with what the professor is doing right now and I'd like to work under him for grad school and uh, like will you help me get to the professor because I kind of sent a lot of mails to him but he's not responding back. So this person like uh, he was helpful and he really like responded because his resume was good, he liked the research that he did and he made sure that the professor saw his uh, resume and turns out that the professor loved his work and he was very much willing to take him into his lab for research later. So yeah, like shooting out mails to people if like your professor is not responding, maybe send mails to the students who work under them and kind of increase your contact with them and uh, like convince your resume to those people and make sure that your resume is like reach the professor and he takes that into consideration. Incredibly valuable. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Along with the idea of contacting uh, the fellow grad students in the lab, like that's a really important thing because if you realize like, you know, the advisor, you'll probably be working with him or her maybe a half hour to an hour a week at most, where like the other grad students, you see them, you probably are sitting next to them, you know, eight hours a day, every day. So, uh, you know, especially in the early years of a PhD, you learn probably most of the things from the other grad students, not uh, the advisor as much. It kind of the smaller details of like, you know, uh, you know, the kind of lower level details of, you know, setting up experiments and using the lab, lab machines and things like that. Yeah, and most professors will have a section on their website where they talk about who their grad students are and when, when they graduated and what they're doing. And if they don't have any grad students, and if they don't have any grad students who have graduated recently, then that might actually be a red flag. That there might be reasons for it. Well, that is only if the professor updates his uh, website. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> true. <laughs> I haven't updated my website in many years. <laughs> uh, along with that point, though, like one thing I didn't understand uh, when I was applying, like you know, I would always like Google, you know, name of school, like machine learning person, and like kind of like apply to the first person that came up, and that's probably like mm -hmm. kind of the most senior person. But like oftentimes, like they're the person you know that's you know probably most senior in that in that regard that they're probably doing more administrative tasks, mm -hmm. tasks and not as focused on research as you know a younger professor that uh, uh, his or her name might not come up as you know highly in Google results or something like that. Um, so so I guess there's uh, there's kind of a trade off here. Like senior professors, um, you probably have a little more freedom and it's a little more hands off under them. This is a general rule, not uh, uh, a case by case basis can change. Uh, there, you know, so there's a little more freedom and a little more um, self-direction, which can be really good if you know if you have a lot of uh, you know ideas that you want to pursue. But you know, on the other hand, like it's it's more of a chance that you might falter at some point and and, and uh, reach obstacles that they might not as uh, help you. They might not be able to give you as much time to work through as a younger professor that's you know trying to get tenure and like is really on the you know full throttle research wise. So kind of you have to think of like which one you'd rather have. On the other hand, the younger professor, you know, if your interests don't drive with theirs as much, then, then you might butt heads more with them. Do they get to ask questions? Or? They will, but uh, I, after we're having discussion among the panel, and then I'll open it to questions from the floor. But right now, I want your pearls of wisdom to uh, what mm -hmm. else? Uh, so, like, one of the big things I struggled with at the beginning of my program was not feeling like I was good enough because it's really hard, you know, there are a lot of expectations. Um, so this is technically my third year of graduate studies. I did a year of undergrad in my undergraduate degree, um, and my first year was last year in an official program. And so there's this moment, eventually you're gonna, you, you'll hit your program where it's like, it's super stressful, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I'm not sure I can do it, I'm not like, you know, you're struggling, right? Um, but I think this is the first year I felt so confident in myself, knowing that I can, like, I can do this, you know, I can break down these tasks, I can organize myself. Um, so there's, there's this feeling of confidence. So if the program seems like scary or it seems like a lot of work, um, it will, and it will be at first. But it doesn't take long to kind of get over that hurdle. Um, so this kind of chimes back into the words that are always said by like, well, what are, uh, you know, 
community is looking for when they're applying or bringing new students on. Um, this persistence, this drive, um, this ability to, when you are struggling, to just keep struggling because you're going to improve, you're going to get better. Um, just kind of what naturally happens, right? But having that perseverance to, to not let that get the best of you and like drop out or not apply. So don't let the challenge kind of be intimidating because you'll rise and then you'll be the one intimidating others as you're like, not in a bad way intimidating others, but like <laughs> students really you know, on their stuff. Um, they're writing a lot, they're, they seem really knowledgeable about things. Um, so it's something all of us can kind of do. So don't shy away from it. Yeah, I would say more push towards it. Um, so for me, my research right now focuses on constituent communication systems and ICT infrastructure for Congress. And I don't know anything about political science, um, but I have background in Congress and congressional activity, so it's this big bubble where I have no clue what I'm doing half the time. Um, but it's super fun and no one else is really looking at it, so that means that I have so much room to wiggle in terms of what I want to look at and how I want to answer certain questions. So like really going for those challenges, maybe something that you don't know anything about can actually lead to much more enlightening knowledge in terms of the research, but also in terms of what you're learning. Um, and contributing to the field. Yeah. I think it's a, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, another, it's, it's about uh, uh, applying for a PhD program. Um, when you do that, you should be specific on uh, whom you want to work with. Uh, different professors have different styles. Um, I think it's hard to tell unless you do some research in that domain and know their work, and you know some of their students and talk to them. And I think uh, you can do that in the master program through research. Any further comments from the panel? I think it's important not to take rejection personally, that often there can be so when you're applying to grad school, like there can be lots of reasons why a professor might not respond to your emails or it might not accept you. And I've seen in a lot of groups there's an ebb and flow where one year they'll accept a bunch of people and then the professor will be like, oh no, I'm overwhelmed with people and I don't want to accept anyone else for a couple of years until some of them graduate. And when you're applying, as a student, when you're applying, sending your research to conferences, like. The lower tier conferences probably have an acceptance rate of like 50% in my field. And for the higher tier conferences, it might be more like 10%. So it's normal for a paper to go around and get rejected two or three times before it's accepted. And that, that just happens. So, and if that happens to your first paper, then it's really demotivating. So. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, like, especially the top groups, like, if you get rejected, it doesn't mean like you're not good enough. Like, for instance, my friend as uh, at Princeton, he works with a very famous uh, person. He had 400 applications for three spots in his group. So, you know, obviously there's like a ton of people that were more than qualified. It's just kind of luck at the draw at that point yeah. almost. With this, I'm going to open the uh, session to questions from the floor. Uh, anyone have questions or comments they'd like to yes. ask the panel? Please. Um, so, I have a question in that I'm asking like why to apply to grad school, and I was wondering why some of your experiences <coughs> or expectations you guys have going into grad school, whether it be masters or PhD. So, why we personally apply to grad school? Uh, or any expectations like what do you want to get out of grad school, for example? Um, I mean, that's going to vary a little bit, probably, depending on discipline. I mean, in very vague terms, like, for me at least, it was, I enjoy, I, I enjoyed my undergraduate, I enjoyed learning, and the parts of it that I liked the most were the parts where I got to either be in a smaller class, like a seminar-style classroom, or work more individually with a professor on something, and the idea of getting to continue to do that as a grad student and get to do independent research really appealed to me. Um, and I mean, you know, there's the sort of more utilitarian, like, y you get, you might get like a higher paying job, or if you're interested in academia, that's kind of the way to go at this point, is having a PhD if you want to teach in university is kind of 
more and more of an expectation rather than a bonus. Um, but for me at least, I think, and in terms of just like your own like happiness with your choice and your own like mental well-being, like at least part of it should come from the fact that you enjoy the discipline that you, either the discipline that you studied in your undergraduate or you like the idea of continuing to work or work, starting to work even if you change discipline more deeply with something and getting to do individual research with a professor or a group in a lab setting or things like that. But it might depend depending on the actual field of research being done. For me, it was more than interest. It was a career switch. So basically, I was working as a developer, and I realized <coughs> that I was more interested in user experience. And I really wanted to learn more about it. But when you get into something and you don't have the skill set, then how are you supposed to switch? So that is why I decided, like, I want to learn more about this field, so let me get a master's degree. And it could possibly lead to a PhD. I wasn't like sure if I'm like ready for a PhD. So that's why I took this intermediate step of, of like a master's. I'll uh, find out if I really won't like this focus area. And I want to go, or else I'll go back to the industry and pursue user experience. So that's why I decided. Like, so the question why is really important. Why do I want to do it? That's the question. First question you should ask yourself while applying. Yeah, for, for me, it was basically, uh, even since like, early, like late in high school, early in college, I just wanted to know a lot about artificial intelligence, and, and like, it seemed like you know, you know, every book and every paper written on it was written by someone with a PhD, so then I kind of deduced that that's what you had to do to become you know, an expert. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so I think it's just, you know, just, like I said before, any curiosity, and especially for a PhD, and if, and if that's kind of, if you think you might be interested in something, but, you know, maybe, is, is, is less kind of uh, emphatic as that. Maybe a master's program is better at least to get uh, you know, advanced classes in first before kind of taking the full plunge. So for me, I did maybe in my entire undergraduate career, I was already doing research with a professor because I got really, really lucky and got in a lab immediately. Um, and I just sort of knew from the get-go that I loved human-computer interaction research and I love looking at how technology affects broader society. Um, so I knew that I just wanted to continue doing that and do my own research and it's kind of like the best job. I mean when you come to grad school you're getting paid to like ask questions and like try to figure out what the answers are to those questions. And there's not many places where you can do that um, and have the freedom to really explore what you want to explore. Like obviously that comes with a lot of like um, downsides in terms of like what the expectations that people have for what you're doing, but having that freedom to really just question the world and figure out what you want to contribute to it, I thought was amazing and exciting, so I just need to do it. Yeah, I think one of the things that I kind of motivated for the PhD for me was the, the skills I could acquire from it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really big into design, uh, both games and graphic, um, so a little bit of developing and coding but user experience is a big part of both of those fields. And so with the PhD, um, it just gives you a huge tool set to present to any company of things that you can do, past examples of your work. You have a lot of documentation skills, a lot of uh, explaining skills, all things that are gonna be important in being able to do that job. Um, a lot of companies also nowadays don't have, uh, they're, they're transitioning to having dedicated teams for user experience, but it's still pretty new. So it's easy to go into a company, and if you have this past experience and you have this kind of, uh, uh, authority as a PhD, you can just start that department for that company. So it's a really easy way to gain a lot of um, kind of upper level, senior level design um, jobs or opportunities with the PhD. So rather than starting on the bottom and kind of working up, you get uh, like a mid-level kind of career entry or possibly even um, the senior level. So just by starting or lobbying for those jobs in the companies. Please. <clears throat> um, for like those of you who went to undergrad with maybe like larger lecture sizes where you didn't know your professors as well, like how would you recommend going about getting recommendation letters? Working with them, poking them, talking to them after class, All right. stopping by <coughs> office hours, saying hi. A lot of times people don't get that. Or maybe starting with their TAs and saying hi to them because they're probably lonely in an hour of their office hours when no one shows up. So as a TA, I'll usually, t I've TA'd for 100 people and five will show up to office hours, ever. <laughs> so, yeah. So 
Uh, so for uh, for find, uh, finding some uh, some professor to write a recommendation letter for us, so is the repu uh, reputation of professor uh, makes does the uh, does it make make a difference? I don't know. Uh, then probably it should. <laughs> it should. <laughs> it should. It, it, it probably has to do more with what they say it about you than yeah. the yeah. prestige yeah. of the professor. Right. Um, e exactly how they frame. How they know you is the most important yeah. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, is a professor who teaches high uh, high level uh, course uh, important? To, I mean, Not really. so we needed to find some some professor who teaches high level course. I don't think so. No? so. I mean, one thing is that the more recent the references yeah. the better so if you're thinking about someone that taught you in your first year that you never worked with again or didn't really keep in touch with versus someone that you had like this year while you're applying then it's going to be harder for the person who taught you that long ago to write you a better reference because they might not remember you unless you've maintained a relationship especially in larger classes yeah and the one other thing i'll say about like prestige is that Overall, I think the content of the letter is what matters the most, but I do think that a certain, if you happen to have a good relationship, I wouldn't go for someone who's prestigious over someone who knows you better. I think that that is not something you should go for, but if you know, if you say you have a choice between two professors who you've worked with closely, and one is a full professor who's well regarded in their field, and the other is maybe just getting started, there is probably a certain low level of just like recognition will do you a favor, but it shouldn't be the main thing you think about at all, I would say. So generally, we just find this um, professor we, we meet uh, in, in junior, uh, junior or senior, right? Because they, they maybe remember us, right? It, it can depend. If you have a really good relationship with someone who taught you in a freshman year, or if someone taught you twice, maybe in your first two years, rather than your last couple of years, then that it's it's all sort of it's the kind of thing that you'll have a sense of for your own personal context just like which professors you know better and that you feel know you better yeah. and who you've done good work for they don't and have to be professors either yeah they don't have to be full professors or yeah. things like that thank you was there a hand at the back uh, yeah uh, so I guess this question is for anyone who um, just got into a PhD program out of undergrad um, so I was kind of wondering, like, what was your background? Um, because I, I'm in kind of a situation where I'm doing, I'm planning on doing, like, I'm doing research right now, and I'm doing uh, research for the rest of the year, um, and I want to apply just directly to a PhD pro program. The problem is um, I don't really have a lot to say right now, you know, because it just started, and I, but the applications are due in, in like November-ish time. So I, know, I was wondering, in this particular case, I mean, is it even worth me? Applying to oh, yeah. programs with your yeah. If you're doing research right now, like that's perfect to put in your statement. Be like, I am doing this right now and starting this, and this is what I'm gonna be doing for the next few months. Like, it, you don't have to finish it, but knowing that they're actively doing it in the process of applying to grad school is super important. Doesn't mean you have to finish it. I just got really lucky because I was already published by junior year of undergrad just because my professor was amazing that I worked with, and she gave me a lot of opportunities to publish, which not a lot of undergrads do. Um, so just knowing that you're actively doing that, even if you're not published or haven't finished the research, is awesome. And I think um, <coughs> later in the application process, even after you've submitted your application, you can probably send emails to the uh, department, admission department, saying that you know I was working on it and it got published now. <laughs> so uh, that gets considered too. So yeah. if you you can just say right now that you're working on it and. Eventually, if you publish something or if you have something to show, you can mail the admission department saying this This is what I want to add to my admission uh, letter. So. so when you write your personal statement, um, you can talk about a lot of things. It doesn't have to be complete research because I did not have any publications uh, even after my master's. So uh, I did finish a thesis, so I actually developed very thoughtful questions, very concrete research plans. I addressed that in my personal statement. So I was able to totally come like into a different PhD program without any background in um, human-computer interaction. But as long as your question really asks provocative thinking, 
and um, like it, it, you justify your arguments basically in your, in your thesis, sorry, in your personal statement, and um, whoever reads it understand. Okay, this is a big, uh, impactful question, and there's a need to solve this question, and you clearly articulate it very well. It doesn't matter if you have published or have not published. It's more of what you're thinking about this problem, problem, and what have you done to equip yourself working towards that goal. And two, I think it's important to remember that the like the competition falls off dramatically. The kind of lower down the list of you know, rankings, whatever you make of them. Like for instance, like yeah, Stanford, Berkeley, CMU. Like yeah, we'll be like getting in there. Is you know you need great scores, great grades, great research experience. But like you know, even after the top ten, like probably even you know most of the applicants don't have strong prior research experience. Then like you know, and then and then and then just because the school is down, you know maybe you know not the you know. Uh, you know, elite type you think uh, doesn't mean they don't have great faculty. Uh, you know, like even places like um, you know, if you go to the big machine learning conferences, like there's papers there from you know everywhere in the top 50. And you know, essentially once you're there, like once you're somewhere that publishes there, like then nothing really matters, right? It's kind of like self-determined after that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, jobs depend on your publication record and really nothing else. Like they take someone, you know, at you know wherever uh, over Stanford if the person from wherever has more publications. It's kind of simple as that. Um, and one thing, if I was understanding your question correctly, I think part of what you were saying was that your worry was that as an undergraduate, you don't really know what you would write like a dissertation on yet, necessarily. Like, so, so that's part of what you meant in terms of like research background, is like you're doing stuff, but you're not necessarily sure like what your bigger project would be. But I mean, one thing I would say, like everything that people have been saying so far is absolutely correct that the fact that you're doing research at all is great. Um, you'll never be held, like in virtually any context, except maybe in some that I haven't encountered, like I could imagine maybe if you're saying you're doing a certain kind of research, you get put in a certain kind of lab, but you never get held to the exact project that you tell a university, or even most like scholarship agencies. You don't get held to that, because people realize that your ideas change. Maybe you have a research question and you find out like, the day after you submit your application that like you found this book several pages down Google Scholar and like, oh, they totally sniped your idea and <laughs> you now have to start from square one kind of. Or maybe like look into that book and say, okay, well what's something they didn't do so that I can reframe this issue? But yeah. no one will ever hold you to that. And in fact, in a certain way, this is kind of like a life hack. Like, you know, you don't always want to do this, but like in some ways, at least starting an application with a project description of a project you've already done as though you're about to do it is a really great exercise for figuring out how the, to get the format of a personal statement down. Mm -hmm. Because then you, you don't have to say like, you can, you know, you frame it as like, these are the results you expect to get or, you know, while you're doing research, you're saying like, these are the things I will do even though you've already done them. But it makes it easier. If you're not worrying about those little details, it lets you really focus on the form of the document. Which, as an aside, I don't think we really talked about it, but like the personal statement, depending on what they ask of you, can be like a really tricky thing to write, and it's a weird genre where you kind of have to sell yourself and your skills, and people don't usually like to do that. Um, so I would say like even applying to, for a PhD to do the research you're currently doing, or maybe if you want to like take it one step further or something like that, would be absolutely fine, and then you can totally change your mind if if you get in and decide that you want to change your mind. Way over there in the back. Uh, is there some kind of limit as to how many letters of recommendation you could reasonably ask one professor to, to write for you? Let's say you're applying to so many different programs from a diverse array of long. All of mine uh, did all schools. 15. Yeah. So. I, yeah. It can depend on the professor and how busy they are, but usually the best thing is to give them advance notice. Mm -hmm. Like don't don't send them an email two weeks before the deadline saying, hey, here's my CV, write me a letter, please. Just start, I mean, if you're applying this year and deadline's are in mid-December, I'd say like, start getting in touch with people now saying, hey, I'm gonna be applying for this and that. Would you be willing to write for me? And sometimes, you know, some places want three, some places want four, some places want two. So, you know, have, don't expect the same three people to write for you everywhere. I mean, once they've written you one letter, quite honestly, they'll probably just copy paste it and change a few things to better suit the school. That's absolutely correct. Um, <laughs> you know, because professors are very busy too. But at the same time, you know, having like four or five people in case, oh, 
I'm going to this school that has more of an arts focus, and so I have like one more artsy person who maybe like CMU doesn't care about as much, but like somewhere else might care about more, mm -hmm. or something like that. Whatever your situation may be, you hope that they would write for you for all of them, but always have a couple backups just in case. Yeah, and for my recommendation letters, when I asked professors to write it for me, they said, okay, send me your personal statement. Mm -hmm because it makes it a much stronger letter if they can validate the things you've said about yourself on your personal statement. So you might want to at least have a draft of that ready to show them if they ask for it. So when I email, in addition to attaching my CV and personal statement, I also attach a little bit of information about the school, like what they're looking for, so they know who to write to, like their audience to write the letter to. I sometimes even just in the email say, I'm really interested if you can comment on like my uh, communication skills, my teamwork skills, w uh, working in the lab. Like be very specific. <coughs> if you can write a little paragraph uh, to kind of help them guide how they can write the letter, they are more like appreciating of you doing that. Yeah. That's really good advice because that's also a good first step for grad school in terms of managing your advisor. And you want to manage them the same way that you're managing your recommendation letters. Of, like sending them reminders, reminding them again to do it, <laughs> remind them another time to do it, giving them all the information they need beforehand so they have everything they need and don't ask for it later. Like that's the type of stuff that you need to do in grad school too of being proactive and making sure you do everything in advance. So like take your recommendation request as a first step to grad school of being like, okay, this is my first time I have to like manage somebody to get what I need out of something, which you're gonna do all throughout grad school. So. There was another hand. Yes please. Um, so my question is if I eventually want to get a PhD degree um, is it worth the extra effort in two years to finish a master's first, or should I just skip it? And um, it's kind of like, so if you have a master's degree, is it like, does it help for you to like, like, does it help for you to get the PhD like, like better or like faster? Or I think that depends on the school. Uh, at least for UCI over here, it doesn't really matter when you go to PhD. The first two years, you still require to take classes, even, even unless you want to waive your your classes. But um, I would say, if you want to do PhD eventually, then just go for it, um, because who, who knows, right? Um, uh, for some certain school, your PhD will cover the cost of your master degree. So technically, you get the master degree for free instead of paying it. So, uh, and then um, again, uh, if you want to do PhD, just do it. Uh, it's, it's not like a contract where you, you have to like seal it with your soul saying that, yes, the next five years I'm gonna do PhD, I'm not gonna quit. But, uh, there's an option for you to exit if you feel like <coughs> um, PhD is no longer suitable for you or your situation changed or whatever. Yeah, in the orientation right now, they told us that if you're into a PhD and it's not working out, so they actually help you, the advisors help you to figure out how you can get a master's degree out of your PhD. And yeah. then you can, you can anytime change your plan. Yeah. Oh, you can change your advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there are cases where you would get a master's first, but they're pretty rare. Like if you want to get a PhD eventually. So one example would be if you're, what you want to do a PhD in is completely unrelated to what your undergrad is in. Then, so you might need a master's first to show that yes, I can do computer science, but I'm guessing for people who are here in this room, that's probably not the case. And plus it helps you in writing as well. I saw that there was a huge elevation in writing. Like uh, if in a PhD, I guess you have to write a lot and master's as well. And the, I have like classes like research methodologies, which uh, like uh, I need to write papers as the class papers, but uh, you have really good resources all throughout the university, like the writing center. And it's really helpful to like take that step towards PhD, I feel, because PhD requires you to, I think, write a lot. Uh, would you be applying only to American schools for your PhD? American schools and Canadian schools. Okay, so for Canadian schools, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, <laughs> well, you've been waiting for this question. Yes. <laughs> um, um, it's actually much more common in the Canadian system to do a master's in two years and then do a PhD in three. <coughs> They're like two separate degrees that go over the same 
five-year fast-track period that, we, that you have in the States. So I'm at a bit of a weird boat where I did my two-year master's and my PhD would have been three years, but then I came here. So now it's five-ish years, but there are some equivalencies I can get because it was a similar field. Mm -hmm. So it, in terms of Canadian schools, it may be that, like there may be certain programs where they let you as an international student try and do a fast track, or they may say, okay, you're applying for the PhD, but you don't have a master's, but we like you, so come and do a master's first. And then that'll be, you can speak about that with them specifically, but I would say in a lot of contexts, in the, in the Canadian system at least, it's something that's pretty different from here, that there are usually two distinct degrees that one leads into the other, but you can't necessarily do both at the same time. In the interest of time, I'm going to have to draw the session to a close. I note that there's still quite a bit of food back there, so please take it as you go. And please join me in thanking the ICS Student Affairs Office and our panel.